Hello everyone. Well, as a result of the fatal bridge collapse in Florida in 2018, Texas officials halted the construction of two major bridge projects. This was done to make a design review for these bridges because the same designer, Fig Bridge Engineers Incorporated, was involved in all three projects. In this video, I'll cover recent developments in the design and construction of the New Harbor Bridge in Corpus Christi, Texas. Construction has just resumed on this bridge after a two year shutdown. I'll give a brief overview of the bridge problems, detail the corrective measures required by Texas DOT and agreed to by the design build contractor, and I'll discuss some of the broader engineering implications of this whole saga. The US-181 project over the Corpus Christi ship channel is a signature bridge project for Texas DOT, which has unfortunately been mired in controversy primarily over the bridge design. These issues led to a halt in construction in August 2021 by the design build contractor Dragados Flatiron as directed by Texas DOT. This halt was ordered following serious design and construction related concerns that were uncovered by the independent engineering review that was started by International Bridge Technologies. IBT was retained by Texas DOT since serious questions arose about the validity of Fig Bridge Engineering's design for the main span of the New Harbor Bridge following the fatal collapse, as I mentioned, of the FIU pedestrian bridge in Miami. If you've seen my recent video on this FIU bridge disaster, you'll know that the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, issued a damning report relative to the mistakes made by FIG Engineering that led to the disaster. This resulted in the lead engineer for FIG, W. Denny Pate, voluntarily giving up his engineering license in Florida. The Federal Highways Administration, FHWA, debarred both Pate and FIG from participating in any federally funded projects for a period of 10 years, that is, until 2029. I'm sure that Texas officials had both technical and political concerns about whether FIG had made any design errors, and as a result, they were ordered to be removed from any further involvement in both the New Harbor Bridge and the New Channel Bridge, which is in Houston, Texas. But I also have to clarify that Arup CFC replaced FIG as the designer for the New Harbor Bridge following the initial independent review. Following this designer replacement, the contractor, Flatiron Dragados, stated at the time that they did not anticipate any major design changes as a result of this change. However, Texas DOT continued to have their independent reviewer, IBT, involved and stated that there were several design deficiencies remaining for the bridge. Work on the New Harbor Bridge started in 2016 and was supposed to be completed in 2020 at a cost of approximately $800 million. Currently, the bridge is expected to be completed in 2025 at a cost of over $1.2 billion. Once the new bridge is completed, the demolition of the existing Harbor Bridge is anticipated to be in 2026. Usually they use explosives to bring down large sections of old bridges, but I think they're likely to take this bridge down piecemeal to avoid blocking the ship channel with debris. Here's some video footage of a bridge demolition in Missouri that took three days to clear the debris from the navigable channel instead of the 24 hours that had been planned. Of course, this would be unacceptable for the ship channel in Texas. The construction of the new bridge is not unlike that of a massive Tinker Toy set. For the bridge superstructure, you have segmental box girders, which will be post tension with cables. Each box girder will support each of the three lane road sections running in each direction. In between the segmental box girders is a delta frame. These girder sections will be suspended by post tension cables connected to the main span pylons. All of these precast concrete components were built at a nearby casting yard, and it's been reported that all components that are to be made in this casting yard have now been completed and are awaiting installation at the bridge. Here's some video footage showing the casting yard for this project. In order to resume bridge construction, Texas DOT has agreed to remove its prior notice of a default against the design build contractor and to contribute $400 million associated with implementing the corrective measures. Here's what will be required to resolve the five main design and construction concerns in order to complete this bridge. The first is to install additional drill shafts and connect them to the existing drill shaft supported pylon foundation. These existing shafts are connected to an 18 foot thick concrete cap. IBT in their review found that the majority of the existing drill shafts would exceed their design capacity under certain loading conditions. It is my understanding that this is a result of IBT considering that the 18 foot thick reinforced concrete mat it would in fact behave in a flexible manner instead of as a rigid element. I'll discuss this more in a little bit here. The second corrective action will be to extend the footing mat to connect to additional drill shaft foundations. The third corrective item will be to strengthen the resistance of the connection between the delta frames and precast segmental units by roughening the interface and adding connecting reinforcing steel. The details for resolving the fourth issue have not been finalized yet, but will involve concerns about uplift of the drill shaft foundations supporting the intermediate vents for the main span 
under the pylons under certain loading conditions. And finally, the fifth corrective measure is to address concerns about excessive torsion and stress imposed by the construction crane associated with the installation of the main spans. So those are the corrective items. The approach bridges have been completed and the self-propelled gantry crane is being removed. Now work has begun on installing the main bridge spans. The good news is that none of the existing construction for the new harbor bridge will have to be replaced. This is not the case for the new ship channel bridge in Houston, which has just resumed construction following a similar shutdown period which has included replacement of significant portions of previously installed bridge elements, including the pylons. As a result, additional construction costs for the state of Texas will be approximately $300 to $400 million for each bridge. Since I'm a geotechnical engineer and not a structural engineer, I'd like to delve into more details associated with the foundation upgrades for the intermediate vents under the pylons supporting the main spans at the New Harbor Bridge. Again, IBT determined that because the mat connecting the drilled shaft foundations was not sufficiently rigid, that some of these drilled shafts would be overloaded. Also, there would be some shafts in an uplift condition and the mat wouldn't have sufficient internal shear resistance. Here's a short clip showing the installation of a drilled shaft foundation on another project. A big part of my engineering consulting practice involves construction phase non-destructive testing using cross-hole sonic logging methods. Here's a video if you want to learn more about this test method. It's not clear yet whether these issues can be resolved with the foundation by adding more drilled shafts and extending the overall size of the mat. In my research, I have not seen any evidence that Flatiron Dragados has taken any legal action against FIG for their part in the design deficiencies alleged by Texas DOT. It would seem to me that Texas DOT agreeing to pay $400 million to the design build contractor to continue construction would probably eliminate the need for any legal action, but I don't know. You know, there's quite a contrast between the design and construction of the original Harbor Bridge that was completed in 1959 and this replacement bridge. The existing bridge was designed by engineers who used slide rules and hand calculations to complete their work, and the bridge has been in service successfully for over 60 years. The existing bridge was one of the first to use post-tension concrete members and the first to use neoprene bearing pads between the girders and pier caps. The replacement bridge will also be post-tension, but the design was performed using sophisticated computer programs, which, according to Texas DOT, resulted in several design errors that have yet to be corrected. And while massive, the new harbor bridge does not involve any new technologies or construction methods, unlike the original harbor bridge. So, to me, it begs the question, what is the fundamental problem with the state of bridge design and construction on some of these major bridge projects these days? Let me know your thoughts on this. Also, it occurs to me that, in general, when sophisticated computer analysis and modeling are performed to support the design of a bridge, it's entirely possible that two different design firms would make different assumptions related to what goes into the design models. Such assumptions may be reasonable, but have different implications involving the adequacy of a given design. Now, I'm not in a position to say whether the independent design review was based on reasonable yet more conservative approaches, that seems to be the case, relative to the original design, but the fact that Texas DOT and Harris County are willing to spend an extra $700 million following a two-year construction delay on both projects is perhaps telling. I'm just saying that from a political standpoint, I don't think there was any way that FIG would be retained on these projects on the heels of their involvement with the FIU bridge collapse, which I think is quite understandable. Let's go back to the use of slide rules and hand calculations for the original Harbor Bridge design in the 1950s. I started my engineering career in the era of handheld electronic calculators which had overtaken the use of the slide rule. We played around with using slide rules as a novelty, but I remember that we carefully thought about what calculations we were going to perform in advance because performing these calculations with the slide rule was rather tedious. Is that the missing aspect in today's engineering design? The aspect that since calculations are easy to set up in a computer program and you can run endless modifications with ease, are people less inclined to do the deep thinking that was done in the past prior to performing any calculations? Be sure to check out the link in the description to download your free digital copy of my summary of the biggest civil engineering disasters of the past 100 years. Thanks for watching.